Hi, this is Harriet Grayson, your host and producer for Community Culture Showcase. And to end our summer, we have with us our features artist for our upcoming art gallery opening. We want you to tell all your friends and family and associates to come to the studio, especially if you've never been to our studio. What a great opportunity to see the great artwork and to nibble on a little wine and cheese. We wouldn't want you to go away too hungry. So let me introduce our featured artist and my guest for today, Beth Pies. Welcome. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about yourself and this, and, and tell us how a great artist, the process one goes through in terms of making art alive and real. Well, my process mm -hmm. is a little bit different, I think, from a lot of other people's in that I am not a plein air painter. Mm -hmm. I don't stand outside in the sweltering sun fighting off mosquitoes and dropping my pastels all over the ground. Right. I tend to work from photographs in my studio. Mm -hmm. They are always my photographs. They are usually from my travels or local scenes, the sunsets on the water, things like that, right. famous landmarks in right. Mystic or in New London, or from travels in Europe and South America. Anything that makes me stop and go, wow, mm -hmm. that's amazing. Right. I want to share that. Mm -hmm. That's something where I take dozens, if not hundreds, of photos and then work from those in my studio later over the course of a number of weeks looking at numerous photos, looking at the painting, putting it on the wall, staring at it on the easel, figuring out what needs to be fixed, coming back to it a little later. Sure. I will generally have half a dozen paintings in progress okay. at any point in time. Right. And so I've brought not only a couple of finished paintings sure. to share, but also some works in progress to kind of help people understand what the process is like. That's wonderful. So you are based in Hartford. I am based in Hartford and Groton. My studio is actually in Groton. Okay. And I show my work in both places, actually, throughout the state. Mm -hmm. And I have work in private collections throughout the country. Uh, Colorado, California, Vermont, Wonderful. Florida. Wonderful. And a lot of collectors in the Connecticut area. So how did you, now we know each other for decades. And we know each other under a whole different umbrella. <laughs> so to speak. Yes. So the question is, how did you get involved with, with art? And why pick pastels versus the many other medium that you could have chosen? Both excellent questions. How I got involved with art, first of all, is that was my passion. And initially, I was an art major in college. Mm. As did many of us in our generation, I got a lot of pressure to study something useful. Oh, that you could make money from. That I could make money <laughs> from, which I did. I ended up in market research because to me that combined a lot of design and advertising and art and creativity along with marketing and psychology and understanding the impact of words and colors on people. Mm -hmm. So it was that or interior design. And right. frankly, there was more math in interior design, I thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> silly me. <laughs> Uh, and more money to be made in market research. Yes, yes. So I ended up in market research, which of course is how we met exactly. for a company with an umbrella that could remain nameless. Exactly. And art was always in the background. It was always something I loved to do. It was always something I tried to make time for. I went through a period of making jewelry, mm. mostly because I was enamored of the colors of the semi-precious stones. Okay. I went through a period of faux finish painting. Um, there was no stick of furniture that was safe <laughs> within <laughs> arm's reach of me, again, because it was layering the multiple colors. Okay. And I finally figured out that for me, it is all about the color and the energy. Mm. That's what I love. That's okay. what I want to share with people in my work. And pastel, because it's the most colorful and brightest and quickest. Okay. Because I was always combining my art with my other work as a corporate exec, as a small business and nonprofit consultant. I was always stealing time for the mm. art until very recently. And so pastel is something that's relatively fast to work with in that it doesn't require you to lay out smears of paint Mm -hmm. Mix them with water or turpentine. Mm -hmm. Clean your brushes afterwards. Right. Keep the paint from drying out in case you're going to want to come back to it. Mm. Um, oil and acrylic are time consuming in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, watercolor is more particular. It requires uh, a finer attention to detail than 
frankly, interests me. Okay. Um, it's not very forgiving of mistakes. Mm. You know, you get a smear of color on that blank white page and it's not going away. Mm. With pastel, you can change, correct, layer, come back in three days later if you only have 20 minutes and turn the painting around oh. and, and then walk by it again next week and make notes as I tend to do about, gee, that guy in that painting looks like he's walking towards me and I wanted him to be walking away from me or I changed it from a rainy day scene to a sunny day scene mm. so I need to put more shadows in there. And so I'll make myself little notes and I'll go back to the easel and if I only have 10 or 15 minutes, I can make a big change in the painting. You couldn't do that with a wet medium. Pastel is a dry medium. It's literally, it's sticks of pigment with just enough binder in them to keep them from crumbling apart. Okay. If you don't push too hard. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but because it is just sticks of pure pigment, it's basically, it's me and that painting surface. Mm -hmm. No brush, no turpentine, nothing to get in the way okay. of what I'm trying to show, what I'm trying to express, the energy and the emotion I'm trying to convey in the painting. Right. So pastel, for me, is the perfect medium. It's bright, it's quick, it's immediate. Mm -hmm. I can convey that sense of urgency and energy, the thing that made me stop in my tracks and go, wow, I have to show people what that looked like. Would you say that something like pastel is, a, is pure because it, uh, you, you're not diluting it with anything? Yes. yes, as opposed to, say, oil paints have ground up pigment and oil mm -hmm. so that they're liquid enough to come out of a tube. Right. Um, chalk, which a lot of people think is pastel and it is not, okay. it, chalk is a mineral and it's basically like powder, like talc, it's chalk. Mm. And it's a, there's a tiny bit of pigment in there, which is why they're so faintly colored, usually. Yes, yes. Pastel is ground up pigment. Mm. Uh, maybe it's cadmium, maybe it's ochre, whatever okay. it is, it's ground up pigment with just enough binder in it to hold it together as a stick. Mm. Ideally, no more than that. The softer the pastel, the better quality it's considered to be. The harder it is, the more binder that's in it and the less pigment, the less expensive and the, the harder and the lower quality, generally. Interesting. So the, the softer ones are the better ones. The softer ones are therefore, because they're more pure pigment, also more expensive mm -hmm. and also trickier to work with. Uh, you press too hard and you've got very expensive pastel dust all over your studio floor. <laughs> that is part of the reason that I don't care for plein air painting because a strong gust of wind comes by, knocks over that box, and you have the most expensive dirt you're standing on that you'd ever want to see in your life. Yeah. Because they will just crumble because right. they're, they're pretty delicate. And so it's a, a very much of a learned skill to know how hard to press mm -hmm. with that pastel stick. Right. Because part of what you do with pastels is you layer colors and you want the colors to be able to bounce and refract light off each other because it's tiny little crystals of pigment. Mm. And to the extent that you can layer them without muddying them, without smushing them into each other, mm -hmm. you'll get more of that light refract refracting right. and you'll get more vibrancy in the painting. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, if you look at some of these paintings, you'll see I've got one color over another color over another color over another color. I lay the pastel on pretty thick. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I don't crunch one color into the other and blend them because you start to do that, you get mud. Okay. I mean, it just turns brown when okay. you start putting enough colors smushed into each other. Yes, yes. Um, so I'm very careful not to do that, but you want just enough coverage that you're getting the areas of the surface covered so you don't have blank spots. Of course. But not so hard that you crumble the pastel. Yes, yes. So it's a balancing act. Sure, light touch, light touch. Light touch, and there's also kind of a process I follow where the darker colors go in first, mm -hmm. and then the medium colors, and then the lightest colors as kind of the highlights at the end. Okay so that it's, it's far easier to put a lighter color on top of a dark one right. than the other way around. Yes, yes, yes. You can't get that real deep dark if there's something light under it. Okay. For that same reason, for that vibrancy of the colors, mm. I tend to work on dark surfaces. Many people don't. Uh, many people like to work on a, a white canvas or a 
kind of beige colored pastel paper. I like to work on a dark surface because that makes oh, the colors jump okay. off the, the dark okay. surface. Um, oh, actually, the pastel surface itself is kind of interesting. Okay. The pastel surface is textured, uh, roughly textured, almost picture a fine sandpaper. Mm -hmm. Because that's what holds those tiny little crystals of pigment. So you use a very special kind of uh, a special canvas. kind of a special kind of paper. Okay, paper. special kind of paper. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll create the surface that I want using um, what they call a, a medium, a gel medium, which is something that other painters use to put over their paint to okay. kind of give it a gloss. All righty. I can use that and really rough powdered pumice to create a rough surface to kind of create mm. my own sandpaper, if you will. Oh, yes. Yes, I can envision it. Sure, and, sure. And you can drop acrylic paint color into it to make a colored surface uh, so I can get any color I want. Okay, okay. In fact, I don't do that very often because mm. that is another time-consuming step. Sure, And then sure. I have to wait for the surface to dry. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to have all the patience of any self-respecting two-year-old, mm -hmm. so I am not likely to add that step unless I have the luxury of a tremendous amount of time. Usually I will just buy dark colored pastel paper that is already sanded. All right. And I'll work on that. And I can actually show you okay. some of the... Okay, sure. This is a painting in progress. You can see this is sort of a brown. Okay, if you want to put it up here. Hang on. And this is a little lighter than I usually work on, even though it's still kind of a brown and darker than most people work right. on. The reason it's a little lighter is because this was a sun-drenched scene. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted the sky to end up very, very light, and I didn't want to have to put the light blue, the light pink, the light lavender, the light yellow over black. Mm. I would have had to use up way more pastel to do that. Okay. Um, however, you can also see how I've layered. None of these is a solid color. There's orange over yellow, over red, over blue, over just in the buildings. Mm -hmm. There are seven or eight colors of greens and blues and turquoises in these shutters. Mm. There are probably four colors just to show the, the guy's jeans, mm. to show where the sun was hitting and to show where his leg was forward in the shadow. Right. And they're layered. And that's the beauty of pastel. Normally, if you put a red over a green, mm -hmm. because they're complementary colors, they'll blur into brown. Ah, uh, okay, okay. I have to be very careful not to do that. Yes, yes, that you don't mix it. And this painting is of old niece. This painting okay. is, is almost finished. Almost. And some of these notes are from when I had it sitting on the easel in my studio, and mm -hmm. I went by it, and I went, mm. That guy looks like he's coming forwards, not backwards. I wanted him to be going sure, away from us. Sure. Gee, what is that in the background? I thought that was sky, but oh no, it's other buildings. And so what I'll do is I will look at Your photographs. my photographs. The photographs you take. So I'll right. take like a hundred different photographs while mm -hmm. I'm traveling, uh, to the point where <clears throat> my best buddy who's traveling with me will say. Really? <laughs> Do we need another photo of those lampposts? Right. Don't we have a hundred photos of those lampposts? Right. But in fact, each one will give me more information. This one tells me this is really the buildings in the background, but the sun is washing them out. Mm -hmm. This one tells me this guy was really walking away from me, not towards me. Okay. You know, each of them tells me a little something different. And so right. I will often clip the whole thing to my mm -hmm. easel. Right. And then I'll pick and choose what I want to show. Do you have like an aha moment when you say, oh yeah, I know it, it's done? I would like to say I do, and every once in a while I'm that lucky. Okay. In fact, usually this will sit on my easel for weeks. Okay. And then I might move it to a shelf that I have in my studio. Okay. And I'll put something else on the easel. All right. And I'll work on that for a while. Mm -hmm. And then I'll come by and I'll go, what was I thinking? Why is that building there? It looks like it's tipping this way. It's supposed to be going this way. Mm -hmm. And I'll make myself little notes if I don't have time to work on it right then and right. there. And eventually, I will run out of little notes. And I will run out of things that bug me when I walk by it. Mm -hmm. And then I put it back on the easel and say, OK, is it really done? Mm. And then I have a little trick that I do. Mm -hmm. 
where you determine if the composition is really right, if the eye is following around in the painting the way you want it to. Okay. And that trick that I do is I turn it upside down <laughs> like that. Because when you turn it upside down, all of a sudden it's no longer buildings and people, uh -huh. it's just shapes. Yes, and colors. It's just shapes and colors. Yes. And that way you can see is your eye moving around the way you wanted it to? Mm. Or is there something jumping out, maybe pulling my eye over to the corner mm -hmm. when I wanted the eye to be on the focal point in the center of the painting? Okay. So that's, that's the little trick. When I turn it upside down and there's still nothing bothering me, then it's probably ready to put it back on the easel and sign it. Okay, all right. Do you have a but, mentor or somebody that helps you to frame all this stuff about pastels? Is there someone that you followed or? I have a, a couple of teachers I've worked with over the years who have been terrifically helpful, whose style is very loose and colorful mm -hmm. and full of energy and that I admire. One of them is a man called Frank Federico. Okay. And these are both local artists. He's in Litchfield County. All right. And another is Gigi Liverant, and she's in Colchester. Mm -hmm. And these are both artists whose work I've admired for a number of years and who I've painted with and studied with and who are now good friends and I'll just I'll show them stuff and I'll say what's wrong with that uh -huh. something is bothering me about it can right. can you help me figure out what it is mm -hmm. and often as not they can okay and I have other artist friends who can do that but those are probably the two people who have been most influential and right. most helpful for me because in terms of my learning about pastels pastel. yes yes well they actually both work in multiple medium okay uh, they're both acrylic painters, oil painters, and pastelists, but mm. pastel is, is my thing. Mm -hmm. That's just, the, the, the color speaks to me. It's okay. just about the color. I assume that you uh, experimented with other kinds of oh, painting. Yes. So you, you know, you've done oil, you've done watercolor, and then you always come yeah. back to this I idea. I absolutely do not have the patience mm. for oil painting. Okay. It takes months to dry. <laughs> it just takes months to dry. I just can't deal with that. Oh. Uh, I also don't want to be breathing the turpentine. Okay. And I don't want to have to be washing the brushes and getting that off my hands. I'm, I'm a little bit of an organic nut, and mm -hmm. I just don't want to be breathing that stuff. How cool. Of course, saying this, you know, there are dangerous metals in pastels, you know, like oh, cadmiums okay. and things like that, yeah, yeah. but not a lot of it. Okay. And I'm not breathing it every single day. All right. And I'm not grinding it into my skin. I actually have something, a, a product that is a cream that you put on like a glove that you w rub it into your hands. Okay. And that protects you from grinding those pastel pigments into your fingers. Oh. So that when I go to wash my hands, it comes off very, very easily. Quickly. Okay. Otherwise, it could be dangerous if I was doing that every day right. for long periods of time. Right. Um, but that's part of why I don't do oil. Um, I don't do watercolor simply because it would require me to be too careful and too fastidious and to be too organized and plan way ahead. And that's not how I like to paint. Okay. I like my painting to be more um, impressionistic, uh -huh. more in the moment, more about how it feels and how, you know, somebody will come in and say, my husband's actually very helpful in this regard. I'll say, just, just come in and look at the easel and just tell me if something's bothering you. Mm -hmm. And he'll say, well, you know, that building doesn't, and I'll, and I'll grab a pastel and I'll go, how about that? Is that better? Right. And I'll go, how'd you do that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, with watercolor, with oil, it, you can't do that. You know, so watercolor, you it's already a there. That fits your personality. Absolutely. In, ter in terms of your tolerance and, for time. And, and, and expressionistic painting. With okay. Gestures and broad strokes right. and showing the energy my work, in a nutshell, is really just about showing how it felt to be there and mm -hmm. why it was exciting. Okay. That's really my method to the madness. Okay, your, your mission as an artist. It is. It's to, to bring show me, to how it to bring felt me to be into there. into the same event that you actually exactly. experienced. And not to be hyper-realistic in doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could copy that photo if you I could wanted be a photographer. to. But the thing is, I already have some perfectly good photos. Right. And why would I want to copy that mm -hmm. onto a painting? And why would anybody want me to copy it onto a painting? They have cameras too. Right. You know, it's that kind of 
where's the artistry? Where's the creativity? Mm -hmm. What's the point of spending time making this if you're going to only try to make what your camera already did? Right. And cameras flatten things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cameras really flatten things. You don't get that same sense of energy and depth and vibrancy because the camera gets fooled very easily. It picks up on whatever is lightest in right. the scene. Mm -hmm. It picks up on a street lamp. It, a camera can't really do what the human eye can do. Mm -hmm. Can't see the number of variations in color. Can't get the feeling of the scene. I will take literally hundreds and hundreds of photos of something that interests me. I'll, I'll walk through a city when we're traveling, mm -hmm. just nonstop with the camera, soaking right. up a sense of place. And the reason I do that is, you know, I'll pick the hundred best and put them into a photo album, sure. But the other seven or eight hundred mm -hmm. are reference photos. And those are for me to be reminded of how it felt to be there. Right. And that's what I want to show in the work. Mm. That's what I want to show in the work. Like this painting. Okay. Sure. This is the Guard Theater in New London. You know, so I do right. I do some local work. Okay. I have a strong feeling about the Guard. I love what they do. I sure. love the way it's been rehabbed. I love the people who run it. And so I wanted to show how it felt to look at this gorgeous deco building right. in the middle of New London. I didn't exactly try to copy that streetscape. Mm -hmm. Why? It was about the building. It was about the inviting entrance about those curved stairs and wanting to go in and wanting to know what was there and what was it about. And in fact, I'm working on another one that okay. will go with that. Both of these are going to be in the show. Oh, good. This one is sure, show it kind of a work in progress. All right. Okay. Sure. So this is what it might look like when I'm done. Mm -hmm. This is my trying to decide. For example, here, the sky was darker mm -hmm. uh, last week. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, then I decided that I didn't want the sky darker because it wasn't about the sky. It was about the shape of this building right, and, and has, about the marquee, which, which is, is so notable yes, and so interesting. Yes, yes. And, and your eye is going to go to wherever the greatest contrast is in the painting. Mm -hmm. So my having made the sky dark, the eye went right here because the dark blue against the orange, complementary colors, that's the contrast. That's where your eye is going to go. Right. And I realized... That made the focal point up here. Didn't mm. want that. Oh, okay. So I lightened the sky. The focal point is now pointing right in here where the darkest blue is hitting that orange and pointing right to the marquee, mm -hmm. which has the dark lettering on the light colored background. And so clearly that becomes the focal point. Okay. And then the building, the sky, this is all kind of background. You know there's another building there. You mm -hmm. know there's the rest of the building here. But the point is really right here. Right in the marquee itself. Right on the marquee itself. And similarly here, this is something else that might be interesting to the viewers, which is that this building, though we know it's a light-colored building, white or beige or whatever it is, mm. um, I don't use white in my painting. Okay. I don't use beige. Mm. I don't use brown. I don't use black. Mm. I barely use gray because those will dull the painting. They'll just suck all the light right out of it. Okay. So instead, what I do to show that this was dark in the background, there's a dark blue in there. There's a dark green in there. There's a dark red in there. There's a dark purple in there. There's a lot of stuff to show that this is a dark background mm -hmm. without showing in detail, like, what exactly is it? Mm -hmm. Who cares? That's not the point. This is the point. Right. Similarly, you know this is a light-colored building, mm -hmm. but there is no white in there. This is my lightest blue. This is my lightest yellow. This is a pale pink. This is a pale green. This is a pale lavender, so you know that this is a slightly different material than this. Okay. But neither of them is just flat, mm -hmm. white, dull. Mm -hmm. Because, again, that would suck the life out of it. Okay. So instead, I'll use six or seven really dark colors to show a dark area. I'll do the same thing when I paint a tree trunk. Right. I'll use as many light colors to show a light area. I'll do the same thing if it's somebody's white top. But I'll never use just black, brown, white, mm -hmm. because it's about the colors and the way they vibrate off each other and layering them. OK. And pastel enables me to do that. So you say this is a work in progress. Yes. Um, I haven't done the upside down test yet. <laughs> OK, that's what I was going to ask. What's, what's, what's next? What's next? What do you think well, is next? I think I'm almost to the point 
where I might sign it, but now I get into like the little details that I normally avoid. Like, should I tweak some of the reflections on the windows? All right. Should I straighten out some of the terracotta work and the tiles, make them look a little more real, or leave that loose because the real detail is here? Mm -hmm. In that case, should I make this detail a tiny bit more believable? Should I make these things with little stronger edges? Should I make the writing a little more crisp? Or should I leave it to the person's imagination? Right. Because it's impressions. It's impressions, and mm -hmm. people want to see what they want to see in it. Okay. So I haven't quite decided. Once I decide that, I'll sign it, and it's done. How, how do you make that point that says, oh, I've decided that I don't want to, that it's, it's almost perfect, and that's good enough? Partly it helps to have a deadline. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> in this case, of course, since we have an exhibit coming right, up, right. I'm going to have a deadline. Okay, so and, it's and then my framer needs a few weeks no. to get the frame on the painting right. to right. mat it because all of the paintings are matted, like you see here, with mm. um, a white mat. Okay. With a little spacer in between that you can't see, and the little spacer enables any pastel dust that falls to fall down below the mat and not stay in the not mat. Not be visible. Not be visible, not okay. stay in the mat. Because I do work very heavily. I put on lots of layers of pastel. Mm -hmm. And that's part of why you see all the paint yes, here. Yes, the Because that's to right there. soak up yes. Yes. whatever might otherwise fall off right. so that it doesn't happen once it's framed. Yes. The other thing I do is when I think the painting is done, I turn it upside down over a wastebasket and I slap the back of it oh, to shake okay. off whatever might be loose so that it doesn't come off once it's framed. Hmm. So having done that, pastels will last forever. I mean, you think of like Degas or somebody, those are 100, 150 years old. Right. They're no problem there. Okay. Um, it's a very sturdy medium. Hmm. It's just you want to make sure you shake off any loose dust. And that's right. why there are spacers. Interesting. In those mats. To preserve the, uh, the actual painting. To preserve the painting. And that's why there is glass over it. Right. Because pastel is dry. I mean, I could go like this and right. bingo, I've got blue on my finger. And does the, so. uh, does the uh, idea of having glass in any way change some of the color? Because, you know, glass does Glass reflect. can be reflective. Yes. And actually, you remind me of a really interesting point, which is that I don't want the color to change, mm -hmm. and I am cognizant of the fact that when I get glass on it, it will dull it a little bit, mm -hmm. even though I use non-reflective glass, special archival sure. materials when I frame and so forth. Uh, it will dull it a little bit. And so what I don't do, and that a lot of other pastel painters do, is spray it when I'm done. Oh, okay. Because spraying would keep it from having any dust fall off. All right. It would also darken the whole painting. All right. It would turn the whole thing like two shades darker. It's like adding a varnish to a piece exactly. of wood. Exactly. It, it's comparable. Yes. yes. It will darken it, and that is the last thing I want. So I slap the back really hard, and then I do mm. it again for good measure, and then I carry it in this lovely newsprint so that okay. it picks up some more of the excess pigment. Yes. So that by the time it's framed, there's no it's flying. good to go. There's, there's, no there's, there's, dust. there's no flying dust. I mean, no. you would have to turn it upside down and bang it. And then you could probably manage to get some dust off it if you were really mm -hmm. determined to destroy it. Right. But otherwise, you keep it right side up, it's good to go for 100 years. That's great. Now, one of the other interesting things about your artwork is the fact that you have beautiful frames, colorful oh, frames. Thank you. You know, usually you. the art is in black or brown or, or some kind of acrylic kind of a frame that's just white or black. Yeah, it, it's an aesthetic choice. In my opinion, it should mm. be an aesthetic choice. Okay. There are many artists who feel that the, the traditional way of a simple gold frame or a simple black frame is the only appropriate approach, mm -hmm. particularly if one is going to be serious about showing in a gallery and so on. I couldn't disagree more strongly. Mm. Uh, to me, the frame is part of the painting. The frame okay. is meant to set off the painting, to show it off to best advantage. Okay. The frame uh, dresses and encloses the painting so that this one, mm -hmm. I picked up the darks deliberately so that the lighter colors would jump right out. Mm -hmm. 
in this one below here, which is a travel scene, right. it was a really, really sunny day. And the umbrellas were what caught my eye. And then they mm -hmm. were setting up in this cafe. And the musicians were tuning up. And the ocean was behind them. And literally, I stood a block away up on a little rise near a shop. And I stood there with my mouth hanging open, saying, this is just too beautiful to believe. Mm -hmm. So it was all about the sun sparkling on the water and the umbrellas and just the music starting to play. And mm. it just that feeling of, OK, I'm just going to stand here for the rest of the day. <laughs> And watch. And watch. And take my photographs. And take my photographs. Right. That's exactly right. And so, so the the brighter, lighter frame is meant to pick up that first thing that caught my eye. Which is the, um, which the, is the, the umbrellas, umbrellas. The umbrellas right. and to show that it was a bright, sunny, happy feeling kind of day. And the purple in there is picking up. Uh, uh, the purple is more meant to to frame it, if okay. you will, to, mm -hmm. to pick out the darks and the shadows so that the lighter parts jump out. Okay. So every time I frame a painting, I think about which color do I want to pick okay. out, which one is going to look best against mm -hmm. the other colors. Like here, I, well, I could pick out the orange, but I probably won't because it might look funny when I get to the bottom of the painting because okay. it would be too much orange. Right. To be determined, right. um, I pretty much drive my framer nuts. All right, you know she's very, very patient with me. Mm -hmm. She keeps a wall of colored wooden frames there just for me. Mm -hmm. I think there are probably three other people in the world who use them, but yes. she knows I will use them and that I'm in there regularly and that I always want colored frames, and and that helps my work all go together nicely, even though it's not all a simple black frame or a simple mm -hmm. gold frame. It's almost like have a you. package. It's the package and. And they all end up going together really well mm -hmm. because, in fact, my palette is pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. I use a lot of turquoises, a lot of blues, a lot of bright yellowy oranges, a lot of purples, uh, a lot of complementary colors. My palette is pretty consistent, mm -hmm. and my frames they are all the, that they complement right. that, and they're all the thin colored wood. So I, I don't go ornate because mm -hmm. I don't want to overpower the painting. Mm -hmm. I actually bought a pastel painting by a friend a couple of years ago, but it was. At a charity event, it was in a very heavy frame that I can only guess someone donated and she didn't actually choose. And it hung in the house for a couple of years, and I finally just brought it in to change it out the other day because I couldn't stand it. Right. The frame was so heavy, it overpowered the work. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And that's what I try not to do here. I keep mm -hmm. it a very simple, clean, small frame, but in a color that complements the work. Right. It's, it's not incidental. Right. It, it is not, a package. It's a package. Yes. It is not just the one size fits all. Right. Is there a place that you've been to that you haven't done your pastel yet that you're waiting for? You haven't, or is there a place that you that you want to go to specifically because you want to do some? Oh, all of painting. the all of the above. All of the above. <laughs> all of the so, above. There, there's, in fact, let's see. Here we go. This one like that one down there, mm -hmm. is a travel scene. OK, yes. This is from a place where I, I just was. Yep. This is from Provence. OK, This France. is one of the amazing regional markets that Provence in the south of France is known for. OK. And it was just an abundance. It was an absolute abundance. And that's what I wanted to capture. And again, I worked from a bunch of photographs. I had literally dozens and dozens of different angles mm -hmm. in that market. Mm -hmm. And then I finally decided not only which view I was going to show, but also it happened to be a rainy day. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel that way. And okay. most of Provence, it didn't feel that way. So I changed it into a sunny day, mm -hmm. put in some shadows, put in some highlights, showed the angle where the sun was coming through them, showed the sky showing through more clearly than it otherwise did in the camera. Mm -hmm. And that is where the creative vision comes in. That to me, right. that's where the artist adds something that the camera didn't. Mm -hmm. And I was back in that region recently, to your point about is there somewhere you've been recently that you haven't painted yet that you're yes. dying to paint? Mm -hmm. I was back in that region recently on a canal cruise. Mm. And I've only just begun to sort out all those photos. I oh, okay. have to admit there were close to a thousand. A thousand, okay. Um, 
I get a little carried away. That's all right. That's all right. And of those, most of them were southern France. Yes. Uh, we, we did fly into Barcelona, so some mm -hmm. are Barcelona. And I have paintings of Barcelona, which I will bring here for the exhibit. Oh, good. And I have new ones I'm going to be working on from the recent trip. Mm. But the canal paintings, I haven't started yet. I've started sketching mm -hmm. so that okay. this probably looks like absolutely nothing. It looks mm -hmm. like almost nothing to me at this point. But right. what we're really looking at are trees, a canal, shadows along the bank where the sun was coming through. Right. And this is all in pastels. And this is pastel. Pencils. pencils. This is just pencils because okay. this is just my initial sketch. Right. And then I did the whole thing and then I thought, I don't like this composition. This is cutting the page in half, which is a bad thing. Okay. So I decided this is where I would cut it off instead. And I'm still figuring out what I'm going to do with those photos and which paintings I'm going to create from it. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, something very exciting happened from that canal trip which is that my husband and I wrote an article about it. Oh, okay. And that article is going to be featured in a national boating magazine, Soundings. Okay. Soundings, right. It is going to be in the October issue. Which will be available very soon. Very soon. And what is particularly exciting for me about that is they are featuring my photographs. Mm. And these are the photographs from which I'm going to be creating paintings. Right. So paintings of the canal, paintings of the wonderful little French villages mm -hmm. we encountered along the way, the outdoor cafes, the bridges over the canal. Right. The, the Canal de Midi is where we were. And the Canal de Midi is... Midway. A, <laughs> Midi. Midi. <laughs> Midway. It is the UNESCO World Heritage Site that was created for Louis XIV. Oh, okay. He wanted to find a way to get from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean for trade and commerce. Right. The amazing thing is it's still standing and it still works. The canal still works, right. It works better than a lot of our modern ones. Oh, okay. Beautiful stone bridges, uh -huh. locks that hold two boats, maybe mm, four boats. Right. You know, lock masters yelling at you in four languages mm -hmm. because there were mostly Germans, Brits, and French people on the canal. We encountered, I think, two Americans the whole mm. week, which was lovely, actually, because then you didn't have to overhear people's conversations or at least know what they were talking about. Right, you couldn't <laughs> eavesdrop. And it was stunningly beautiful. You know, there were the peaceful stretches with just the trees overhanging the canal, creating shade, and right. you're bopping along and you're looking at hundreds of acres of vineyards and then hundreds more acres of vineyards and mm. hundreds more acres of vineyards mm. until I'd finally say, look, mm. a building. I think mm. we're coming to a town. So I will be doing paintings of some of those towns because then you could get off and walk along the cobblestone streets mm. and they all had their own little boulangerie, the bakery where you could pick up your baguette for the morning breakfast, get your cup of coffee. I mean, they were just lovely, authentic little towns. And that's going to be my next set of paintings. Oh, okay, very good. But your your photography must be so good that this magazine was interested in the photography as well. Have well, you ever thought about? I have in the past showed my photography. Okay, I, I am, I suppose, a multimedia artist. Okay, I mentioned I used to do jewelry. I've shown mm -hmm. my photography. It's just pastel is where I've come to really focus my time. The thing about pastel because it is robust because it's versatile because you can go back in and change things and go over things and is that you get a little spoiled because it doesn't have to be exact mm. and so to be perfectly blunt my photography has gone to hell in a handbasket because I know that if I'm going to turn it into a painting I can change the light I can get rid of the telephone pole mm -hmm. I don't have to draw the car that drove into the scene right whereas with the camera I would have to stand there and wait mm -hmm. until it was perfect again okay so while I still take hundreds and hundreds of pictures, right. I don't expect, and I'm pleasantly surprised if I get the perfect shot. Right. But that's okay because I can make it into the perfect painting. Mm -hmm. Now, what interests them in in, uh, in uh, producing your photographs in the magazine? Well, we had contacted them to see if they would be interested in an article about Canal du Midi because it is a boating magazine. Oh, okay. And we were cruising on the canal. I got you. And they're, so they're always looking for interesting stories yes. that aren't just about somebody's, you know, disaster off the coast of Long Island when their fishing boat turned over or something like that. Yes. They're always looking for yes. something different. Yes, that would be and, different. And in different. fact, when we contacted the editor, she said that they 
had been approached about doing an article on the Canal de Midi, but they hadn't been happy with the writing and that the photos were not of acceptable quality. See, I for, told you you're a good photographer, for, right? <laughs> you know. So we said, well, can we give it a try? And she said, sure, but you know, it could be a while. Our schedule's pretty full. Right. And so we quick threw together the article. Uh, my husband did more of the writing. I did more of the editing because mm -hmm. he liked the trip and the, the rougher camping out parts of it a lot better than I did. So I thought it was, <laughs> it was probably best if he took a stab at the mm -hmm. content. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm a very good editor. And then the photos were all mine. Okay. So I was sitting there with bated breath, wondering when we were going to hear back and whether they were acceptable or not. And in fact, the next thing we heard was, oh yeah, it's going in next month's issue. Didn't you get a contract? <laughs> so very, very excited about yes, that yes. and can't wait to start working on the paintings from those photographs. How many photographs will appear in the magazine? Four. Four photographs. Very good. Very good. And you have hundreds, of course, behind it to do, to help you with your next. Oh, yes. Uh, Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So do you have a, so now that you've collected these photographs and you're, you know now that this is going to be your next major project, mm -hmm. um, what um, what starts it? What How starts do you it? go? You know what goes gets you going so that mm -hmm. you know this is the one I'm going to go on first, even though I have a thousand photographs, and I know this is going to be my next project. I can say that. Sometimes it'll even happen that way. Uh huh. But but in fact, I have these three other paintings that mm -hmm. I've been wanting to finish. I've now got a show coming up. Right. These paintings have to be done in order to be in this exhibit so right. that when everybody comes to the reception next month, they'll see them because yes. I've promised that. Yes. So I'll finish them and then I will get to the next series. But if I can get them started, mm -hmm. that's the key for me anyway. Yes. If I can get the painting started, I will eventually finish it. Mm. I just have to get a block of time to get it started. So often what I will do is I'll start three or four paintings. Okay. So I will start working on this one of the canal. Yeah. And I will probably also simultaneously work on one of the cafe scenes mm. because the canal, while it was beautiful and soothing, for many of my moods doesn't have enough energy in it. So mm. I will pump up the color and I will try to convey more of how it felt. But then I'll switch to a, a more energizing scene with more people in it, with okay. more going on, like the scene there of the cafe. And then I will probably also do some that are more of the buildings of the towns, of how it felt to be walking along these cobblestone streets and looking at the canal right. and, and looking at a little cafe and thinking about where we might want to have dinner. Mm -hmm. So, and that might depend actually on how hungry I am at the moment that I'm trying to paint. And maybe I'll do a cafe scene sure. rather than do the canal right. scene. It can be that um, random. It can yeah. be that random, it yes. really is. I'm, I'm not one of these painters who sets up the still life and gets it exactly right and then I work on that for weeks. Mm -hmm. I just don't have the attention span for that. Mm -hmm. I, I am too interested in too many things and so it helps me to be able to work on three or four at once, to be able to put it aside. Uh -huh. I will put it up on my easel, I will put it on the shelf in my studio. I mentioned earlier I, I walk by it a hundred times and I'll look at it and I'll go, mm. hmm, Okay. I think that building might be better if it was a different color because it's taking attention away from that. Mm -hmm. Or were there waves in that water? What was I thinking of? Why did I do it? And, and I will go by and I'll make these little observations to myself. Mm -hmm. I'll make my little notes. Right. And then when I have a block of time, I'll go back in and I'll work on all three of them. Together? Simultaneously. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, I, I will usually only have one on the easel. Right. Um, primarily because I can only ever fit two on the easel. <laughs> <laughs> but I will be taking them on and off in rapid succession and okay. going, okay, let me try this on here and then I'll put that aside. And then I'll try this on the next one and then I'll go back to that first one and say, so now that I'm looking at it with fresh eyes, mm -hmm. do I think it's working better? Okay. Was that the right fix? And then I might try that upside down upside trick. Upside down trick, yes. And yes. I'll stand back and look at it in a mirror upside down and see if from across the room, mm -hmm. does it draw my eye in the way I wanted it to? Does the right thing in the painting draw my eye? Okay. And then it might go back on the easel for another quick fix. Mm -hmm. Or it might go back up on the shelf 
to be looked at again next week. Right. And I will do that in several iterations. This, this will go on and on for a while, mm. which is why I need to have multiple paintings going simultaneously. <laughs> and eventually, I will run out of ideas for things that need to be fixed, which probably means it's, it's done. Finished. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Now, do you keep yourself, confine yourself to this particular dimensions? Do you get smaller, larger, or are you just most comfortable with this, this size? Because I think I'm not an expert, but they These all look about the same. These are all about the same size. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, lately, I work mostly at this size. Mm -hmm. And again, that is just because it's simpler. It's not because I necessarily favor it. Oh, okay. I do have a lot of paintings that are larger. And in fact, a lot, number of the larger paintings will be in the exhibit here. Okay. But the larger paintings are a little harder to transport. Mm, They're a little yes. more expensive to frame. Mm -hmm. There is a little bit more hesitancy for people to buy them because they have to think about where they're going to go. Because they're big. Because they're bigger. Okay. The smaller paintings, you can pretty much fit them anywhere. Right. And it can be more of an impulse purchase. People are like, I just love it. Mm -hmm. I'll just I'll figure out where it's going later. I just love it. Okay. Because a, a painting this size can go any place. Right. So it's partly that, and it's partly just that it's that much easier for me because I can buy the pastel paper in this size already without having to cut up large sheets. Yes. And I can transport it easily. Mm -hmm. I have little bubble bags. I put these paintings in. I can carry them around without worrying about damaging them, banging the corners, whether it'll fit in the car. I, it's just simpler. Uh, that said, many people have urged me to go back to painting bigger mm -hmm. because of my broad strokes and gestural approach to the painting and mm -hmm. that it's very expressionistic. There's a lot of color. There's a lot of energy. Right. It would work well and does work well on a large scale. Right. And I'll get there. Okay. I'll get there. But for now, because of simply expediency, time mm -hmm. and convenience, I've been working this size a lot. Let me ask you something related to uh, like the business of art, and we, you know we don't want to be callous or gauche, but uh, oh I heavens, would, no, we won't do that. <laughs> I would, what do you think in terms of? I think when I, I look at you in terms mm -hmm. of the stuff that your marketing background experience, yeah. all those years doing other things, mm -hmm. has an impact on you in terms of the business of being an artist. Sure, it does. There, there's absolutely no denying that. Um, many artists sadly, aren't good business people. Mm -hmm. And some artists, even more sadly, pride themselves on not being good business people, mm -hmm. thinking that that would somehow take away from their right. artistic vision, which to me is just foolishness. Mm -hmm. It's the old, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody hears it, you know, if you're an artist and you have a vision and nobody's buying it, Right. Okay, you have an expensive hobby. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. That's not where I want to be. Mm -hmm. I only have so much space in my studio. <laughs> you know? I want to sell the work. I want other people to enjoy it. I want them to tell me how much it means to them and how they fell in love with it when they first saw it. Right. Um, I've had collectors say, you know, I walked in the door and I looked across the room and that one called to me. Or I've had collectors say, I've never been there, but I want to go. I need to have that painting. Or it just makes me smile. I look at it every day. Wow. That okay. just makes me feel so good. Mm -hmm. That's important to me. That's not important to everybody. Yes. But it is to me. And in order to make that happen, I call on my marketing background. I mean, I wasn't a mm -hmm. corporate exec for nothing. And right. I wasn't a consultant for nothing. I know how to do that in terms of I remind people about when the exhibit is up. Mm -hmm. I remind people with photographs about the paintings that they liked, that they're still thinking about. Mm. Sometimes not soon enough. I had a very sad thing the other day <laughs> where, where a collector bought a painting that I knew another collector had an eye on. Mm. And I had to be the one to say, I'm really sorry, but it's gone. Mm -hmm. You know, she or he who hesitates. Right. But in fact, I have a pretty good idea of who my collectors are and what their demographic is. I work very hard at staying in touch with them. Mm -hmm. I work very hard at letting people know about my work and where they can see it. I currently have my work in three different places around the state, and now this will be the fourth. Okay. I try to always make sure that I have at least two exhibits worth of paintings ready to go at any time, mm -hmm. so that if someone offers me a wonderful opportunity, like the TV station here did, right. that I'm able to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. 
So I'll be moving paintings around the state, and I'll be creating new work, and I'll be bringing that all in here. Right. And to be able to do that on short notice is something that not a lot of artists can do. And mm -hmm. I go to some great efforts to make sure that I don't miss opportunities that right. way. Right, you can accommodate them as I'm, they come I'm going forward. to accommodate them, exactly. Right. And right. I'm going to show up when I said I would, have the number of paintings I said I would, mm -hmm. have an organized list of what their titles are and what their prices are and what their dimensions are to make it easier for whoever is hanging the show. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are just some basic business courtesies that aren't as common as they should be. Right. And I really do try to make sure that I'm very easy to work with as an artist. Because the, the art schools now are coming to the realization, of course, one of the things they got involved with is art administration, mm -hmm. which is a very different animal. Yes. And then, of course... Done that, too. <laughs> is the teaching artists to be better at the whole business of selling their stuff. And if they can't, um, if they themselves don't feel comfortable doing it, then finding somebody who can help them do that. Absolutely. So my husband has a cousin who is... Um, she unfortunately has Alzheimer's now, but she was a, w a wonderful artist, and she did not want mm -hmm. to get her hands dirty. Mm -hmm. But she had a um, a very helpful sister, uh -huh. and her sister was able to get her showings like you know all over the East Coast. Yeah, and so obviously someone she trusted and someone who could set prices. Right. You know, artists don't necessarily even know what to price their work at. Yeah. Well, I I have friends in the Hartford area. He's a phenomenal photographer. His wife is the business manager for them. That's right. There you and go. And there's nothing wrong with that. If, mm -hmm. if that just doesn't suit someone's personality, Right. Uh, if they're just not organized enough, if they're not outgoing enough, whatever the case might be, then you find somebody to do that. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, the notion, though, that some artists hold of, well, I don't want to get my hands dirty. I don't want to sully mm. myself by being mm. a business person. This isn't a business. Well, yeah, it is. Right. And and if you think that you're somehow going to you know, wave a magic wand and all of a sudden a curator for a famous museum is going to show up on your doorstep, lots of luck with that. Right, exactly, exactly. You know, you have to work for it. Okay. And in my other role as a consultant, I have done focus groups among artists mm. for regional arts councils and funders and other organizations where we talked with artists about their art business. Mm -hmm. And it was astonishing to me, it was actually appalling to me, how many of them said, oh, it's not a business. Mm. <laughs> well, if you don't think it is, I guess it's not. Um, but then it's an expensive hobby. Mm -hmm. And don't expect somebody else to be taking care of you and knocking on your door and saying, oh, you're so wonderful, will you come show your art? Right. right. You know, you have to be out with people and be in places where art gets shown so that people can see and enjoy your work. Right. Right. And to me, if other people aren't enjoying this, if they aren't excited about a market in Provence, if they don't love the mm -hmm. guard, if they are not travel buffs and they want a picture of a cafe in South America, if, if that doesn't excite them, then they're not my audience. Right. But if that does excite them and I haven't let them know that it's available, then shame on me. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Exactly. The uh, studio, this studio, SEC TV, is, is a nonprofit. And um, in my show in particular, we like to promote the arts and culture of this area I into Rhode Island. And one of the things Frank, as the executive director, and I have talked about for, for a couple of years was this idea of creating a, an art gallery. There yeah. was a, a gallery here in Groton that is no longer um, around. And we thought, mm -hmm. well, here's that vacuum. Uh, we are a nonprofit. We are completely committed to this idea of our mission of helping and being involved in the community. So that's why we created this will be our fourth showing, mm -hmm. and again, it's um, September 22nd. Yes. We want everybody to come. If Please nothing do. else, <laughs> uh, get a little taste of local art. You can get a little wine and cheese, but that's not the reason why you're here. I want you to appreciate art. I want you to appreciate Beth. She gave us a lot of her time today. And how many paintings do you think you'll have? Oh. There will be at least 30 paintings 30 in paintings. this exhibit exactly. of mine, and then there will probably be another half dozen paintings by a friend of mine whose work is very interesting, I think, uh, and very complimentary to mine, but, but completely different. She's an abstract painter. Okay. And she works in acrylic. Acrylic, all right. And she does some multimedia mm -hmm. work with interesting textures and shapes and, 
and marks on the paper, right. uh, but completely abstract, mm -hmm. but very colorful, very fun, very right. accessible, none of this, you know, moody, like, what is it, conceptual right. stuff. Right. It, it's something you would want to live with, but very, very different, similar to mine, only in that it's colorful and mm -hmm. expressive. Mm -hmm. And her name is Michelle Mara. Michelle Mara. Okay. And she's going to be showing with me. Good. She will probably have about half a dozen paintings in the show. Hers are a little bit larger. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will probably have 30-something paintings okay. in this upcoming exhibit. So we're very excited about very it. Very good. Yeah, so I, we want everybody to come on out. It's, it's very important. We want you to support our local community. We want you to support our local artists. So that tell all your friends, September 22nd, uh, Thursday night, 5.30 to 7.30. And again, there will be a little wine and cheese, but mostly there's going to be art. We want you to fall in love with Beth's paintings and her friend's paintings. And we want you to kind of fall in love with the whole art community, that we want to support it. And the way to support it, of course, is to come on September 22nd, 5.30 to 7.30 here, SETCB. Our studios are actually located in Grot Groton Shoppers Plaza. Between Benny's and the post office, I always tell people who have no idea where we are located. And it's in a strip mall, but we are here. You come on in, and it doesn't look like um, a strip mall. It looks like an art gallery, and, of course, we uh, it looks like a TV studio. So we want you to come on out. Um, and again, tell everybody that you know about this, because it's a, it'll be fun. And it's always nice to meet an artist and shake their hand. So I've had Beth here. We've been able to chit chat. You can shake her hand, admire her stuff, and uh, you know praise her stuff to her face. <laughs> and there's the lots of parking right in front, <laughs> oh, and it'll be yes, supporting parking. the TV station as well. Exactly, exactly. So as a nonprofit, we do uh, we do profit a little bit, but mostly our mission is to support our local artists. So again, September 22nd, tell everybody that you know, 5.30 to 7.30. And Beth, I want to thank you for coming thank on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. And she, this was just a sample of all the stuff that she's got available to there show us. There will be lots of local scenes. There will be lots of travel scenes. There's a story behind everyone. And you'll be so here to answer those questions I, and tell I the story. I will stories. indeed. All right. <laughs> so please, come on by September 22nd, um, 530 to 730. And I am Harriet Grayson. I am your host and producer of Community Culture Showcase. And it was my great uh, opportunity to meet, for you to meet our featured uh, artists for our upcoming art